Hi, um, my name is Stephen, and you're probably seeing this because you're looking at an article I put together about how to use Reaper for audiobooks. Now, the first thing I'm going to say is there are many ways to do this. What you're seeing here is a collection of all of the shortcuts and everything that I've developed over the last seven years of using Reaper for this work. And I um, and there's an article that kind of shows you how to set it up in that way. But what I thought would be useful would be recording a video where I was actually using the setup so you can see how I do what it is I do. And that way you can see whether this was a, a good way for you to work as well. So the first thing is um, Reaper works equally well on Windows, Mac, and Linux. You're seeing me on a Linux desktop, but it honestly does not matter. Um, it should work the same, just the Windows will look slightly different depending upon the platform that you're on. So let's get started. So the first thing I'm going to do is I already have Reaper started here. And, um, and there's an old project I've got set up. <clears throat> and when I start a new project, what I tend to do is I take the name. So I'm going to use rename so I can copy the name very easily. So I've copied the name of the new project I'm going to work on, and I'm going to make a new project, which I could do just as easily with the keyboard shortcuts instead of what I'm doing here. And I paste that in, and I just take my name off the end of it. So now I've basically saved this, so the Reaper project name matches what the publisher is calling the book. And I hit save. And that gives me a brand new Reaper session where my first, my first paragraph, my first chapter is already called opening, as in opening credits. The way my system is set up, um, you're only going to see one chapter at a time. And this will make more sense from the article. Everything is built into custom chapter, uh, custom actions. And I named everything chapters instead of tracks because I was trying to stay in line with working with audiobooks. And one piece of advice from the article I'm going to reiterate here, these keyboard shortcuts that you're seeing here in the window or in the article are customized for the keyboard that I'm using. And um, they're easy for me to find in the dark. I, um, I don't work with a lot of overhead light when I'm working. Basically, the light from the screen is enough for me. And I want to be able to just feel the keyboard and be able to do all of these commands. So that's where they come from for me. My suggestion is that once you've played around with it, you show the action list and you go and you find each one of these and you change all of them so they match something that works well for you. So just to quickly run through what they say in the custom actions, <clears throat> I have uh, punch and roll, which is the method of recording. A new chapter, go to end of chapter, go to start of chapter, trim to start and end of chapter, and uh, mark character voice reference, show a character voice list, show and hide all of the chapters, chapter audio online or offline, you'll very rarely if ever use that, export chapters, that's very common for me, render mastered chapters. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail there because that actually um, would be something useful if you were trying to send finished audio somewhere. Um, and yes, that would take a lot more than what this video is going to cover. And then convert chapters to MP3s. So we're going to go over most of those here in this video. Let me um, open up the book that we'll be working on. And in this case, just to point out, I typically work like this on one wide screen. I know a lot of people will have a separate device, an iPad. Um, I find the one wide screen method works well for me. <clears throat> it is a monitor from a company called BenQ. The reason I got the monitor is it is a blue light controlled monitor. So it's a monitor that's designed for you to be able to um, work with text for a long time without it being very fatiguing on the eyes. And what you're seeing over here is a PDF reader. And what you're seeing over here is Reaper. 
And the interesting thing is you're, you can tell by looking at the titles of both windows that Reaper is the focused window. But if I scroll up and down over this window, even without this window being active, I can scroll this while this is still in front. The reason why that's useful is by doing it this way, I can still issue keyboard-based commands that Reaper will see while I quietly scroll through in order to work, if that makes sense. So we're not actually going to record the whole book. Um, I'm just going to record some dummy audio, but I figured showing you the setup made sense. So typically, since this particular publisher, publisher wants three seconds of room tone first, I will step out of the booth and I will record three to four seconds and put that in the beginning. Let me do that now. Okay, so they want three seconds. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back here to four because since four seconds is more than three, I've given them the three seconds they want at the beginning. And this is where I would record that opening. And it would go something like this. Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents A Fortress in Brooklyn, Race, Real Estate, and the Making of the Hasidic and there you have a, a mistake. There's no the. And so I'm just using the keyboard commands as described up on top. I've come back to an empty space here in the audio. And um, that empty space corresponded to about here. If I listen. Right. So I'm going to pick up after the word presents. A fortress in Brooklyn race, real estate, and the making of Hasidic Williamsburg. And <clears throat> usually I'd go on, but I haven't, I'd like to, I'd like to say that his name is Deutsch, but I'm not sure. So I'm not going to bother looking that up now <laughs> in order to make, make certain. So let's pretend just for the, uh, for this video, that what we've got is the entire credit. And I would move on to the next thing I'm recording. I'm going to skip this for now because it doesn't really matter for what we've got. And we're going to make the next thing introduction because that's what this is. So I'm going to hit the keyboard command for new chapter. And when I do, you're going to see that it's hidden that previous chapter and it's given me a new chapter and focused on the name. So introduction. And now if I hit the keyboard command, that's going to start recording. Um, again, what you'll notice, the way this is set up, I hit the record button and it does a pre-roll of a couple of seconds. It indicates that it is recording by turning red partially. So I have an easy visual knowing that it's not playing or doing something else. And once it goes through the pre-roll, it starts to work. I'm going to make a couple of mistakes here on purpose very quickly, so that way you can get a sense of how we, how we do punches. Introduction, an American epic. The streets of Williamsburg were not paved with gold, as early waves of immigrants had dreamed, nor did they contaminate those who walked upon them, as the Hasidim had feared before they arrived as refugees from war-torn Europe. Instead, their names evoked a different mythology. So <clears throat> I realized there wasn't a mistake there. And again, I'm not keeping this as final audio. This is really just more for you to get a sense. Yeah, this is just more for you to get a sense of what we're doing. And let's see, so that's war-torn Europe. Is that, yeah, war-torn Europe. So we're in the right place. Um, I'm listening back and realizing this, so I'm going to pick up here. So here's the difference. When I do that punch at the beginning, I'm basically getting a countdown until it goes. What happens here is it will actually play the audio before the punch in point, a couple of seconds of it. And then when it crosses the punch in point, it's picking up. So I'm just going to record a little bit from there so you can sort of see and hopefully hear how that works. 
Instead, their names evoked a different mythology, one more redolent of that other place called Williamsburg, located a world away in Virginia rather than Brooklyn. George Taylor, Willie, you know, so I didn't like that at all. Let's do that again. Instead, their names evoked a different mythology, one more redolent of that other place called Williamsburg, located a world away in Virginia rather than Brooklyn. Again, I'm not really happy with what's there. And, uh, you know, I, I kept recording. So obviously that again is not part of the book. I'm not happy with it, but let's just pretend that we've got something here that we like. Um, I'm just going to record something over that little weird piece there. Um, doesn't really matter. So yeah, let's just do that. Let me, um, let's, let's do that then. I'm going to cut it. I'm going to snip. This is a built-in Reaper feature. And then I delete. And when I do that, the audio is gone. And I use the key commands to bring me back there. And let's say I'd like there to be a little bit more of a tail. So I'm going to just hit record and not say anything. Now, if we pretended that was all of the introduction. Again, I'm just trying to keep the video short. What I would do next is I'd record chapter one, which I would hit the new chapter button, write chapter one. And now I'd record chapter one. Now I'm not gonna move ahead in the book. I'm just going to record something. So that way we have a chapter one here. Chapter one. This really isn't the chapter of the book. This is just me putting some audio in here so we have an example of what this might look like. And that is likely the only time I will ever have a chapter where um, we haven't punched in my little fake chapter there. The other thing that you may be noticing is that occasionally you'll see this word modified show up here at the top and then it goes away on its own. That's because any of the custom actions that made sense, like um, punch and roll or new chapter, automatically have as part of their action the um, um, a save feature. So it's not auto saving everything, but basically, if you were to try to work and then if you had forgotten to save and you just went on to punch in again or make a new chapter, it's going to do some saving along the way for you. So that way, if you don't hit save all the time, it actually is. So I'm going to record, I'm going to make one more and I'm going to name this one closing. So it's a very short book, right? And I could move all the way to the end and do the, you have been listening to, but let's just make it up because there's no reason for me to show you what's going on here. Um, and if you're wondering how you would get something like this, um, well, on a Mac, you can use the built-in preview app which I'm relatively certain still has a way to reverse the, the text. So that way you're dealing with white text on a black screen, if you like that better. Um, if you're not on a Mac, you can use a program called Foxit Reader, which is free. Actually, you can even use Foxit Reader on the Mac if you try it and prefer that. Uh, one of the nice things about Foxit is it works on every platform, including mobile. And um, if you save your notes into it, unlike um, iAnnotate, which a lot of people like that's on the iPad, you can actually read all of those annotations on every platform and not just in Foxit Reader. Other standard PDF readers can all read the notes. So that's an advantage over using iAnnotate, which really, unless you go from an iAnnotate user to another iAnnotate user, you lose the ability. So let's just put a closing on this. You have been listening to a very short book that I didn't really narrate. This is just a demonstration. All right, so there's our very short book. At this point, we don't really need the uh, PDF anymore, but I, I want to just keep everything the way I typically use it. If I remembered right now to hit, and let's look at the top of the window, you'll see what I was talking about before. If I hit save, you would have seen the word modified that was here disappear. So right now, if I wanted to send this book to a publisher, 
um, what I wind up getting is this. I can go and use the action, and I'm going to show all chapters because that's a, it's a toggle, show high in all chapters. If you only see one, it will show you all. If you, um, if you see all of them, it'll go back, but I wanted to show it to you on the menu. And, and so now, I'm sorry, just a moment, I, the sound changed in my headset, but you're seeing all of the chapters here. And that is, you know, that's sort of the point. Now that I'm seeing all of the chapters, I can come into the action and I can then say, I'd like to export chapters. And as long as export is set to all chapters, it will do the entire book. If you had a publisher contact you and they only wanted a couple of chapters re-exported for some reason, you could manually select those chapters and then do selected. Um, and then let's do that. I'll hit process and then you'll see those all go by. So that went by so quickly simply because this is a very short book. Um, it goes by relatively fast in most cases, but in our short little book, um, it went by incredibly fast. So let me do this and let's go back to the single chapter view. And now I will show you where all that went. So that went into this folder called exported. And let me take out the ones that are not from uh, older things that I had in here from other other things that we had done. Uh, here's what you're, and I, if I do it by modified, it'll make that make sense. And I'll just take out these other things and then all of this should make sense to you. So these are from old projects. All right, so now if I organize by name, now you'll really get a sense of what's going on. So here it is, you're seeing zero one opening and with the word consolidated. Now, how do I go from this to, um, you know, to something that I feel is deliverable. Well, the first thing I do is back here, I rename the, the uh, folder that I just had using the name of the book. Why do I do that? Well, this way I get a folder containing everything that I want. Now, on Linux, this is a built-in function. On Windows and Mac, as described in the article, there are ways for you to do bulk renames. So I'm just going to do rename here and I'll get a little window and I'm going to tell it that every place you see dash consolidated, I'd like you to replace that with underscore and then the name of the book. And I'm gonna take my name off the end because of course they know it's me. I do rename. And now what they're receiving is zero. And where did these numbers come from? Those numbers came from the 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 track numbers so in the way that i'm working what you wind up with is it automatically handles numbering for you it inserts the name of the chapter which is all you did there so you don't need to maintain a numbering pattern and then because all of them have dash consolidated you can replace globally for a whole bunch of files um, within one step the you know the word dash consolidated with the name of the book and in this way You've got a consistent naming pattern, and you can modify this workflow if your, um, you know, if your producer wants something different. But now all I do is I just upload this particular uh, folder as is to the uh, to the publisher, and then it's ready to go. Uh, and the next time Reaper exports, since there is no exported folder, it'll make the new folder so that way my audio will just appear in the right folder. So let's say. I've gotten my corrections back now. I'm, I now have to record re corrections for this book. Now, one very nice thing about using this setup is that let's say between the time I've recorded this book and, um, and, and the books that I've done in the middle, let's say I've made some minor changes to my recording setup because those things are saved within the project that you're doing. Um, the, the project that I did months ago, which I'm now getting pickups for, will have exactly the same microphone settings as I had when I recorded it. So if I changed anything, um, this will make it as identical as possible. And so this is what I do. I come back in, I open this project back up again, and I'm going to make a new chapter. And when I make that new chapter, I'm just going to name it CRX because that's typically what we refer to 
um, corrections as. So I do this, I type in CRX. And now on this one file, and what I would have up over here is I would have up um, like a listing of here are my corrections. And here's corrections from an old book. And so what I would basically do is I would take the corrections, I'd put them out here, I'd have them, I'd move back and forth between the corrections and the marked script to make sure that I was doing things properly. So you can sort of understand what that would be like. And then I record them leaving spaces between them on the track. So my corrections might be something like narrated by Stephen J. Cohen. This has been a really interesting book. And what I'm doing is I'm leaving enough space between them and I wind up with a single long file. Now, when I use that export action to export chapters, if I tell it instead of exp exporting all, if I tell it instead to um, just export selected, oh, sorry, problem on my end. Let's make sure I've selected it. So here I am, I've selected the, the chapter. Now let's do that again, action, export chapters. Here we go, that's set to all. We're gonna set it back to selected. And actually, I don't think that is coming across as selected. Let me do this again. So what I know works, and I'm sorry if, if I'm having a little bit of an issue here. Let me go back to when I see it. One second, it's being a little, having a moment, clicking on it. There we go. So now I'm, I'm back here and comfortable. Um, I can just consolidate export tracks to selected and process. And when I do that, you're seeing the exported folder came back and it's the same thing. The new folder knows it's track five, which we don't need anymore. And I can just rename that and upload it. Um, let me show you what I was talking about before if we only wanted certain tracks. So if I switch so that we're going to be seeing all the chapters, I can then manually select a bunch of chapters and have those export. And what you'll see happened here was since I selected chapters one, three, and four, that's what came out. But really all I would have needed to do is just manually rename this because all it really is, is the CRX for this book. And then I just would have uploaded that, but I wanted to show you how I would use that function. Um, if I skip down to the end of this, so you can sort of see how we convert chapters to MP3s, I'm going to select <clears throat> the exported folder. And now I've got those three in. I just decided to do those. And you're seeing that we're set the same sample rate to, you know, everything is sort of set the same. And 192, we could do, we could do with that. I mean, I can manually set this to what we expect for audiobooks, which would mean making that mono 192. Good. This is all fine. And then I just hit convert. And what we've got from there, if we go back and look in the, here we are, hold on. Oh, that's right. If I move back out of export, I converted them. I'm sorry. <laughs> Render. <sighs> I love the fact that I've goofed. I love the fact that I've goofed. Where did they go? What did I? <laughs> I apologize, people. They went someplace. So where did they go? It says, um, oh, it went desktop. Okay, here we are. See, this is one of those things. That, oh, so it's in the exported folder. I got it. 
All right. Yeah, it is there. But it came through as wave because I didn't do it properly. <laughs> Let's try that again, because I probably forgot to set that to MP3. So what is my output? Mono, ah, output format wave. This is what I did. <laughs> See, any of us can have an issue. Constant bit. So this is what I should have done instead of what I did before. So let's convert. And now you're seeing it takes a little longer. Okay. And I'll close the window. And now, yeah, now you're actually seeing them. Here they are. Here are the MP3s. So that way I could I could work in that way. And that was my mistake. And yep, nothing is is foolproof. Like I said, I don't wind up using that as often. The bulk of my work is working directly with uh, with the publishers. But um, as far as the features I did not show you, let's move back here and I can show you uh, one of them. So one of the features is about trimming to the beginning and the end of the chapter. And this is how that works. So there's an action in here that says um, trim to start of chapter. So what it's going to do is it's going to make that the head, it's going to make sure that everything to the left of where I drop that marker is not longer than what is typically expected, which is between a half a second and three quarters of a second. Totally not an issue. In fact, you want to leave long heads and tails if you're sending to a publisher because they appreciate the extra room tone. But if you're trying to trim things up before you send to um, ACX or someplace like that, then doing this, as you'll be able to see when I hit it, that ate the audio. As you can see, the audio is now gone before that. And this has left about six tenths of a second in its place. And so you can jump to each chapter and trim the heads and tails so that you'd meet ACX specs on beginning and end. And let's see, the other thing I did not show you is the character list, which is actually one of my favorite things. I'm going to change. I'm going to move back to um, chapter one because there was a little bit more audio in there, and this might be easier for you to see. So I did that by showing all the chapters. And then after showing all the chapters, I, um, I, all I did at that point was I um, I showed all chapters, I selected, and then I hit the same toggle again, and it dropped me in. Let's say that here, at about this place in, in, in the uh, piece, so let's say this is an example of a voice, and let's make that an example of Herbert's voice, right? So I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to select Mark Character Voice Reference. So I'm going to make that Herbert, H-E-R-B-E-R-T. And now you're going to see, and I've got a little thing from Zoom in the way. You probably saw that and didn't even see when I moved out of the way. This is now marked Herbert. And if I were to move from this chapter to another chapter, you wouldn't see that there. That's the reason why I'm using what's called the take marker, because that just isolates it here. Now, if I were on a completely different chapter, let's do that. I'm going to move back to the end of the book. So now I'm here. And I want to uh, show my character voice list. So now we're seeing Herbert listed here and it says where Herbert is, but it would be a list of a lot of them if, if there were a lot of them. Now, if I wanted to move back to this, I can't really do that easily without showing the chapters first. So let's do that. I now know that it's in the introduction, which is on track two, because that's what it says here, introduction 02. So I know that we're on 02 and it's, the introduction. So I'm going to do that. And I'm going to jump back to the beginning of that chapter because I'm going to act like we weren't already set to it. But if I click, it brings me to Herbert. So if I were to, let's say, um, you know, go somewhere else and let's say over here, let's just have a character. Here we are. We add another one. If we add another person to this. So instead of Herbert, um, Amelia. So now that's Amelia. And so we've got Amelia here and Herbert there. So I can jump from Herbert to Amelia. So I can, when I'm many, many chapters later, quickly jump back and hear both Herbert and Amelia in their original context. 
without me having to save out extra files, do anything else. It's all built into the project right here. And, um, and the project saves all of the other settings that go along with it. And um, the article that goes along with this video shows you how to utilize the other things. So just running through the, the list to see if there was anything I did not explain that was here. Um, online and offline audio, I explain why we're, we're not going to use it, but it's there in, um, in the article. It's sort of a backup feature in case you need it. Um, and we did not do render mastered chapters. So just to quickly explain why, um, what you're able to do is right now when we consolidate, which is really the feature we are using, we're not using render when we're sending stuff out here. We're not actually sending the audio through more effects that are in Reaper. We're sending the raw audio out very quickly and simply. Um, by using the render function, you're able to send through a number of effects that you may add to um, here, the mixer. So it, like what I would be able to do, and it would make more sense, we're only seeing the introduction because it's the only one that's showing right now. But what we would be able to do is I could either put effects here on the chapter if I just needed to affect this chapter. Let's say this chapter was louder or quieter than another chapter. So I wanted to use another effect, or maybe I was recovering from a cold when I recorded this chapter and I want a different effect to help take care of some extra mouth noise or something I have going on. I could add an effect just here, but on the master, which is what everything would get rendered through, I can put effects that I wanted to apply to everything in general. So I would typically want to use about the same amount of compression, about the same amount of EQ and things of that sort. And so the render function would be sending the audio through those effects to change the audio. So it will take longer than the exporting, the consolidate export, because in that case, we are not sending it through any effects. So it's just generating the file as is. The fact that it, the files get generated and then pushed through whatever effects you have um, is what's going on there. Typically, I do not attempt to come to an absolute final master that's going to hit ACX spec through Reaper. I do what we tend to refer to as a rough master. And what I mean by that is I will <clears throat> get the audio very close. And then afterward, I will make the minor tweaks to the rendered audio, which might be making something ever so slightly louder or quieter, things like that. Because usually what will happen is I will be within, you know, within spitting distance. I'd be within, I'd be very, very close to releasable audio. And then just listening to each file individually after having rendered it through lets me know, oh, I just need to take this one down a bit, make this one a little louder because the files are all so close, um, those sorts of changes. So they all hit spec at about the same values are very simple to do. So I hope this was helpful. This, uh, like I said, was not me explaining how to build it, but this was me running through the methodology that I use. And um, hopefully the article is helpful and this is helpful. If you have questions, leaving them as comments on the article is probably the best choice. So that way other people in the future can look at your comments and potentially learn from them. So I hope you found this helpful and have a good day.